Okay. Objects, so you can uh, <coughs> you can make copies, um, and and similarly uh, you get the same. Uh, uh, they they behave, they inherit all the other graphics properties that are available, um, and you can do there uh, other shapes have been added like polygons and stuff, and uh, and there's also a uh, 
a green thread scheduler that lets you do uh, dynamic behavior. So, for instance, uh, well, here's a, here's a polygon that you can pick up and move around. Um, and if I take this and uh, this little halo is our user interface that, that helps to uh, it helps to deal with the problem which you'll encounter if you try to do a system like this of both having developer support and user support in there. Um, so that's a way of bringing up our commands. Um, so there's a little inspector that lets you inspect the properties of that polygon. And you can also write code in it. So I could say this uh, start stepping every uh, 50 milliseconds. The uh, rotate by uh, method with a parameter of 0.05 or something like that. And uh, okay, so now we've got a uh, <clears throat> now we've got a spinning star, and <clears throat> you can pick that up and move it around while it's live. Um, you can make copies of it, so you can have a lot of fun with this stuff. Um, so, for instance, I could take this and reshape it that way and uh, pick this guy up and drop him on there. So now I've got a little sort of magic wand thing and I can stick that on there, you know. <laughs> so, so this is how it should be, right? We shouldn't be surprised. Um, I mean... Uh, <laughs> Uh, poor mathemat mathematicians, you know, for, for centuries had to deal with, with looking at the outside world and abstracting it and coming up with cool little theories. Now we can write cool little programs and they go out in the world and make these neat graphic things and music and all that good stuff. Um, okay, so um, just moving right along. If you take those shapes and just add, you know, a little bit more script, you can build up widgets in ways that you all know well. Um, and I'll just show you a little bit about uh, this. So in this environment, I mean, I've got a cloth that's built here. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And um, in addition to an inspector, you can also get a uh, sort of a more powerful interface on it. Uh, and so that's our module system loading in. Uh, something else. Uh, so here we've got uh, a scripting browser um, looking at the clock, and you see here are the names of the methods. And every every object when you drop it in this world uh, gets sent a message: start stepping scripts. That's what I did to the ellip to the uh, that star. And uh, and if you take a look at this one, it says start stepping every thousand milliseconds to set hands procedure. So that must be how the clock works. So I can go and click on set hands. And yes, indeed, it gets the data object and pulls out the second, the minute, and the hour into variables. And then sets the rotation of the three polygons that are the three hands. Um, here it's setting the second hands rotation to be the current second divided by 60 times 2 pi. Does that make sense? Um, but since the system's live, I can go here and uh, type a minus here and, uh, and accept that. <clears throat> now we've got a clock that runs backwards. And, and that's not to say that uh, a, a backwards clock is a useful thing, but, uh, but just to show you sort of how it's all immediate and in the environment itself. Um, so let's see. And one of the cool things about this is if you build things this way, um, you know, everything runs just fine, transform. You know? um, so, again, people are laughing. That's the way it should be, right? And, and you know, all the text selection still works. And in fact, we can even go in here and uh, <coughs> fix the bug we put in there. And now we've got a normal clock again. Okay. Um, so this is... Uh... <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, so, so this is a, a neat environment, but it's, it's, uh, it's for people like you and me and not for the rest of the world. It's basically a programming environment. And so we wanted to um, widen the community that could work with this kind of stuff. And I hope to show you some apps that, uh, that can be built easily um, and, uh, and some others that, that are real programming. 
Um, but uh, we figured that a JavaScript ID wasn't necessarily the answer for end users. We want something that's sort of more concrete, where you can pull things together and drag and drop and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm going to show you that environment in just a minute. But what I'm going to do uh, is, uh, is first escape out of this, just so that you get this, this kind of a cool aspect to all of this. So if you look here, uh, whoops. this whole thing that we were doing that looked a little bit like PowerPoint, it was just the web page and, and, and that I was editing. And so that little presentation mode is simply, uh, is simply a piece of the lively kernel doing that. Okay. Um, and uh, let me go to here. Okay. Um, and one more of these. Yeah. Um, so, so we came up with this notion of a parts bin. Um, which is a, a concrete repository in the cloud, and there can be a bunch of these, <clears throat> of objects made in the lively kernel uh, that have been serialized and that can be downloaded. <clears throat> and uh, let me see. I don't be alarmed. So a lot of this work goes on at uh, the Hassel Plattner Institute in, in Germany. Um, because that's where my first interns went, and I thought it was a good place to have an open source repository. Um, it turns out to be connected with SAP, where I now work, but I didn't, uh, didn't know that was going to happen. Um, so, uh, so you can, uh, here's an example one. So here's uh, an elephant. This was sort of the, uh, <clears throat> the benchmark, for, benchmark for our polygon uh, testing. And, uh, and there are a bunch of other things that I hope to come back to in a little while. But uh, there's also actually useful stuff here, like input. So here's a slider. <clears throat> and, uh, and then you can, you can hook these things up. So if I, uh, if I go get the, uh, the menu for this slider, um, then I, I can ask to connect. Um, oh, let me move that just a second. Hold on. So if I connect its value <clears throat> up to the elephant in its uh, oh, set scale parameter, uh, then now I have a scalable elephant. So whoops, sorry about that. And um, and uh, <clears throat> now once again, that's not to say that scalable elephants are a really useful thing, but um, it, uh, it gives you an idea of sort of how you can work in this more drag and drop kind of uh, kind of paradigm. And I'm going to take a minute now and run through uh, what could be a fairly serious application done from scratch. And uh, so I'm going to start out with uh, there's some code here for getting at the uh, at the server. <clears throat> there's this thing called the command line. Uh, which you can think of as just being a terminal program. Uh, so I'll put that there. And uh, there's the ls prompt. Let me see if that's live. Yep, OK. Um, so we're talking to the server. And that's because I was already logged in. You, you need privileges to do this, obviously. And you can type more interesting things, such as, uh, <clears throat> I'm not a Unix hacker, but I know this much. MP stat, um, <clears throat> and you can find out how busy the processor is. Um, so something you might want to do is to plot the uh, the load on the processor on your server. Um, and so we'll we'll go through what it takes to do that. Let me uh, come back to here, and uh, this is <laughs> I'm running on top of sources that other people are changing right now sometimes, um, but. Uh, so let's go to uh, visualization. So we have the ProtoViz open source uh, graphics library in here. A bunch of really neat views there. I'm just going to take a really simple one here that will do a, a graph. I'll pull it out. And I'll put it there for now. And uh, get this out of the way. Um, 
Now what we'd like to do is to do a similar thing over here. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to hear the numbers that come back from MPSTAT, and over here on the right is the, uh, is the idle time. So if we take 100 minus that, we'd have the, uh, the actual processing time. Um, so we go here to this menu and say connect the uh, server result, which is the string that's coming back, to this graph over here. Um, in its uh, add data and render uh, aspect. Now that's not going to work at all. We've got a text string coming back, and this thing expects new, uh, new floating point numbers. So uh, what I can do is to go here and, uh, and ask for the connections. In the connections, we can do, uh, this is the one that I just put in, and I can edit a converter in it and uh, put this up here. You can see that normally uh, <clears throat> it just passes the value straight through, as you'd expect. Um, and I've got a little, uh, little snippet of code down here just to save us time. Uh, and if I put that in here in, uh, into the converter, and I'll, I'll tell you what it's doing is really quick. Um, it takes the incoming text, um, breaks it into lines, takes the third one, and then uh, then tokenizes that line and takes the last one, and that's the idle value, and then it returns 100 minus that, um, <clears throat> together with a patch I had to put to get it working because this is uh, a German server and the decimal points a comma. Okay. <clears throat> so if we save that now. Um, now, it should be the case that if I come down here and hit empty stat, see it's now plotting those values. Okay? So, but we're not done yet. We're not done yet now. Um, so now we've, uh, something else we've seen before here, if we go to demos, uh, remember that clock? Oh, I didn't show you, by the way, um, from a previous demo, you'll see the, uh, the windmill kind of thing. I stored that down there, too. Um, so in the clock, uh, we can go to it again and do a connect uh, its set hands procedure, right? Because that gets executed every second. Um, and I'll plug it in here in the, uh, the exec parameter, which is the thing that sends that string away to the server. <clears throat> and then collapse this. Okay, so this is a somewhat nerdy example, but it's just I thought it would get the point, you know, that you can make this stuff be easy. Um, and I'm actually, this uh, winds up chewing up a fair amount of CPU, so I'm going to We'll be making an introduction. Okay. So, um, Dan is here now. Um, he's uh, ready to talk live to you and very excited to talk live to you. I'm sorry we had that. Hi, Ricardo. Delay. words about this. Um, when I thought about this talk, 
I was reminded of, uh, was, let me wait until that. Can you hear this okay? For me now, too. Um, so you may notice there's something wrong here. This is a deep joke. Uh, of course, you know that decimal 25 is the same as octal 31. So um, when, I, when I thought of what to talk about, uh, I thought that my time with smallpox has been uh, a constant, uh, let me, uh, I'm confused by one thing here, which is, uh, are you seeing me on the screen? Yes, yes. It looks... Do you see me on the screen? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, great, okay. <laughs> great. Um, one of the things that Alan Kay uh, always talked about for his favorite teachers um, was that uh, one of his favorite teachers would put a table out with engaging artifacts on it, things that were somehow interesting, that uh, that would trigger students' enthusiasm. They'd pick them up and work with them. And my whole time with Squeak has been one of uh, of working with small bits of programs that were. Uh, that were somehow uh, both simple and really general. Um, and that, because that sort of leads you on to want to investigate. Um, and so I thought I'd just touch on some of those points that, uh, from the history of small talk as I knew it. Um, let me share my screen here. My first uh, experience with small talk was, uh, well, let me just give a, a bit of cr uh, credit here. I'm going to be talking about work that lots of people did. Um, my mentors were Alan Kay and Don Knuth, and my favorite book hero, Cyrus Harding, from The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Um, the work that I did at Xerox Park was with Ted Taylor, Dave Robson, Diana Mary, Glenn Krasner. Uh, Adele and Larry Tesler and Mark Lansner and, and just a whole bunch of people who uh, contributed a great deal. And then later in the squeak work, it was mostly John Maloney, Ted Taylor, Scott Wallace, and then later on, Andreas Robb and Yosh Yoshima Freudenberg um, and uh, <clears throat> Elliot Miranda and Vasily Baikoff. And then uh, things just really took off and everybody in the uh, squeak open source community really helped out. Um, and where it began was, uh, I, I had uh, just had an encounter with APL, which I thought was really neat. Um, it gave you infix arithmetic and garbage collection and workspaces that were a lot like what small talk uh, worlds became. Um, but it, we wanted to be able to generalize that to objects, and, uh, and Alan came up with this new design, which was an extensible language with intrinsic semantics, by which it meant um, that the semantics uh, would be determined by the receiver of a message. And, uh, <clears throat> and he said, oh, we ought to be able to do that uh, just like the list eval, and, and we told him, well, you show us how to do that, and we'll give it a try. So he came up with this sketch of, uh, of an eval that would work that way. And uh, it took him about a couple of weeks. He went home and didn't come back for a while until he had it ready. And then I went home for a while and didn't come back until I had sort of a running interpreter. 
And I wanted to just tell you a little bit about Caldox 72 because I think it is so cool. In a way, I think it's the, the neatest scripting language ever. Um, and the thing it's closest to is the meta system, uh, which is actually a compiler compiler. But what's cool is that every, every uh, object that's running gets handed a message pointer. So if you were to say uh, turtle go d times 5 and turn j times 90, um, the, uh, the, that whole message is sent to this object and it does whatever it wants. And in Smallpox 72 it was just a function, but it could run this code. So here's the definition of turtle in that language. And this word to is, it means defining uh, turtle. It's like to walk, to run, and to turtle you do this. Um, and these, this little thing here will match um, tokens in the message stream. So what's cool about this is that um, the code that you write actually parses the message. And in that way, you can write anything you want. You get to write the parts for your language as well as what the language does. Um, so that was what was neat. And just um, with that flexibility, we were able to come up with uh, the whole sort of object-oriented uh, style of, uh, of message sending. Um, this wasn't made to do that style. It's just that you could write it that way. Um, and I'll just show you a little example here. But, uh, um, let me uh, collapse this guy here. And, uh, so this is an emulation of that written in squeak. And you could do, uh, let me just, I gotta move, I've got a little space window here that's in my way. Yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so you, you can do simple expressions. We, we would uh, run 3 plus 4, and that was when we knew that most of the system was working. Um, then we'd write, which tested just about everything else because it ran the floating point routines. Um, but the, uh, what was nice about this, uh, we were working with Seymour Packard, and it was very simple in this language to do things like, uh, we had a turtle uh, that you could hit in one keystroke that looked like that, um, and uh, let me just clear the screen, and then you could do things like four pi, uh, to 400 smiley um, go uh, 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 and you get that kind of thing on the screen which you're all familiar with um, anyway uh, this whole system was written in uh, in a bootstrap of 44K, um, and just to give you uh, an idea of it, I'll show you this. Um, <clears throat> so it began just defining uh, what two meant, and then uh, and then let's see. <clears throat> Up here, you see this is the little guy who will look for uh, tokens in the message stream. And here is that, remember, we just ran a for loop. Here is the definition of the for loop. And you can see that it has optional parameters. You can say for i, get, start, to stop, and so on. So, um, so what was neat about this was you could define your own language. And from that, we got the style of, that we now know as small talk, um, the sort of modern small talk. Let me uh, plot this guy. And come back here and go on. So um, <clears throat> it really paid off in flexibility. That this, and this was uh, sort of our first engaging artifact. We did all sorts of things with it. We had a bunch of kids who uh, learned to program, and we got to explore 
the object-oriented style. The main problem was, and here's just some statistics about it, we it had 20 classes, 200 methods, and about 15k code <laughs> of, in the system. Uh, the total image was about 30k. Uh, but there, there were some problems, which was that uh, it was way too slow because, of course, it was parsing as well as running all the time. It was not modular because you could write code uh, that, um, that expected certain things, and if you mixed it with somebody else's code, uh, the, the parse was different. And in fact, you could not even read it because you couldn't tell what an expression meant without reading the code that was going to be running. And, uh, but we really learned some things from it. Um, and this is uh, a little bit like the scientific method, you know. In the scientific method, you're supposed to observe things, and then you come up with a theory, and then you perform an experiment to check it out. Um, and in software, you use something, and you find out what the weaknesses are and the strengths, and then you redesign it and then you re-implement it, <clears throat> and then from that you're on a new level where you're using it again and learning. So we learned, one of the things we learned was that uh, we wanted classes to be first-class objects because they weren't in, in uh, Smalltalk 72, although you sort of could create that effect by making instances. Um, and uh, contexts also were not. Um, so, uh, what we wanted is make some sort of compilable syntax, and that was the, the really breakthrough that I had in coming up with the keyword syntax, and that became Smalltalk 76. We wanted classes to be real objects, um, and we discovered that we wanted inheritance. So, for instance, we realized that we wanted to do the same kinds of things with character strings and with arrays and, and such. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> I came up with this design for Smalltalk 76, which is pretty much the design we're living with uh, ever since then in Smalltalk AD and Squeak, um, a, byte, a byte coded VM uh, that was both uh, fast and compact, classes, inheritance, and even context. And this was interesting because uh, in the process of building Smalltalk 76, we built it using Smalltalk 72. Um, and in the process of building it, we, want, we needed to simulate it uh, to, to find out if it was going to work, you know, to debug it. Um, and in the process, we wrote a class context to do that. And then that persisted into Smalltalk 76. And, uh, and that was a real breakthrough. Um, let me just, uh, I'm going to get a change to the uh, Smalltalk 76 paper if I can here. So if you like this kind of thing and, um, and you haven't read this paper, I recommend it. Um, it, uh, it goes through some of the elements. There's some screenshots from Smalltalk 786 running on the Alto. And, um, <clears throat> and you can see here that uh, things are now pretty much like a modern Smalltalk. Here's the definition of class rectangle um, and uh, the method, method names and their code. Uh, we had some special characters like this thing meant return. Uh, uh, well, anyway. Um, and uh, there's class point, and you'll recognize that it looks pretty much like modern code. Um, there's uh, point addition. Um, Uh, here's the, the diagram that shows that whole architecture, which is, is pretty much the same as our modern small talk, um, where you have it. Uh, this is the class, this is the method dictionary, and it points to the, the code for method and, and a method. And it was all pretty much set up as now. This is the static structure. And here's, here's the dynamic structure um, with the context over here and pointing to the code that's running and so on. And uh, um, and the uh, and the entire interpreter worked by essentially repeatedly sending the message step to the context, um, 
And, uh, and one of the uh, really nice things about this system was that it actually could simulate itself. Um, and because uh, context was a real object. So here's, here's how the step worked. Um, pick, up, pick up the next byte code and then dispatch on it. And for instance, here's, uh, here's loading an instance field or loading a temp field. It would go to the temp frame, find the load bits, and push them onto the stack. And then down here, this how sending works. Um, and it would create a new context this way, and then things would start over again in that context. So that was Smallpox 786, and this, as I say, this is uh, this basic engine, this basic architecture has served us for, gosh, 40 years now. Mm -hmm. Let me go back here, and I'll tell you one thing about Smallpox 786 that might interest you. Um, <coughs> We lost a couple of things. When we did Smallpox 80, they all wanted to have a, uh, an ASCII character set, and, and we had several things that were not ASCII. Um, so we had, for instance, uh, this center dot for subscript things. Um, but we also had something that was really neat, which was that uh, left arrow, and I've written it this way, uh, it didn't have the right font. Left arrow was um, considered to be a terminal keyword in Smallpox 786. So um, it was really nice just as you have an assignment for A gets 5. Um, just as you can say A next, you could also say A next left arrow to, to uh, do an assignment. Um, so this made a nice pairing of messages. So you could have next and next get. And just as you had subscripting, um, you could say <coughs> A this is A at I get um, A at I plus one. What, what was nice about it is that the left arrow, the assignment left arrow in the syntax um, changed the precedence. <clears throat> so you did not have to put parentheses. So you could even say things like A plus J get and then A plus J minus one. And uh, because having the left arrow assignment um, meant that you didn't have to put friends around this piece. Sorry, can you hear me? I think we lost the picture. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Nice. Sorry. Do you have it back? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I, 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 my mic is not working when we have this connect, so I probably be inviting you in the, in the chat, so it's, uh, that's okay. I can't see this chat when I'm sharing the screen or seeing the thing right now. Um, but if, uh, if I ask you, can you see the screen, just put your thumbs up so I can see you. Okay, great. Um, so well, this was just to say that um, one of the nice things that Smalltalk 76 had that we lost was this terminal uh, left arrow uh, keyword. But we won't, we won't go with that anymore. Let's just move on. Um, <clears throat> so that system was interesting. It was it consisted of 50 classes, um, 500 methods, and 20k in um, code size, and about a 100k image. Um, and it was a serious five-fold form, and it pretty much took us forward <clears throat> to small talk 80 and uh, and sweet. Uh, let me. Uh, the, I want to say one more thing here. Um, so when we did small talk 80, we did uh, we did a couple of actually useful things beyond that. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the, uh, the sort of really neat accomplishments I thought was if you look at most language implementations, uh, you find out that. If you look at how conditionals work, you know, and an if test, um, you look down and down and lower and lower. And mm, so let me just um, and down inside it's still using a conditional test. Um, but the neat thing was if you look at how um, conditionals are implemented in small talk, uh, 
they're implemented using methods to detect. So if you look down at the bottom, um, there is no uh, there is no test in the in the uh, in the underlying language. There's just a different response to the message if true or false. It says nothing, and for true, it runs the block. So I always thought this was kind of a neat thing about small talk. What it, what it shows is that uh, message dispatch is more general than conditional uh, testing. Um, and uh, another thing that I thought was really cool um, is just the way that inheritance and polymorphism work together to give uh, uh, incredible compactness. So let me just zoom in here a little bit. Um, so here's the definition of max. Um, you test if self is greater than a magnitude, and if true, return self, and if false, return a magnitude. And this, um, let me just, uh, so this code is shared by um, characters, by date, by month, week, and, and all. And, and uh, not to mention all the different numbers, floats, and so on. They all use this exact same code. And, and how can that be? Uh, they can use it because all of these messages, all of these operations are messages, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there are different types of things. So the polymorphism really works together with the inheritance to get a huge amount of sharing in the system. And beyond that, the code itself is really compact. So, so all of this code amounts to just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytecode um, plus an extra word at the beginning. Uh, so. This is, I think, the most compact implementation of a programming system that I know of. Um, okay. Um, so with Smalltalk 76, um, I see, let me speed up a little bit. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> um, we, we're doing lots of work uh, putting characters on the screen, drawing lines, and, uh, and I finally looked at all this code and saw that it was all doing the same kind of difficult stuff, which is moving words from one place to another and dealing with the alignment of the, uh, of the images um, on word boundaries. And I came up with, with uh, this list. And let me, uh, what's the best thing to do here? Um, so, uh, hmm. What I want to say about this is uh, one of the neat things about the Xerox environment was the machines had microcode. So it really encouraged you to write small bits of code because uh, a, a small amount of code could be, could be put in the microcode memory where it would run five times faster. Um, and so <laughs> the, the uh, bytecode interpreter for Smalltalk was one such thing. Um, and this list was another. Um, and this, this idea of finding a small kernel that's general uh, is, a, is sort of a general motivational thing in computers. Let me... Uh, mm -hmm. So it turned out that you could do really fun things with this list. One of the things you could do is to count the number of pixels that were black in a line. So my father uh, teaches Sanskrit, and I actually wrote a Sanskrit optical character recognizer. Um, and so it would work by scanning down the page and counting the number of bits that were black. And having done that, it could recognize what the lines were. Um, this, this is uh, a uh, this is a bar chart of the number of pixels that were black. So that way you can find the lines. And then similarly, within the lines, you could go through and find the word. And then here's the word. And you could go down and you could separate the, the, the vowels are at the top and the bottom. And then the consonants are in the middle. So in that way, you could segment and actually recognize characters. And there you can see there's uh, little boxes around the character. So that was one thing, and then uh, um, 
I'm going to skip this. I also figured out that you could uh, run Conway Game of Life through the entire screen in one bitlet operation, pretty much. Okay. Uh, of a, of a uh, 
curve, and then this one here where we could actually do this. So this is something I have wanted to do for many, many years. Um, sort of like liquid tech. Um, and I think the next thing I'll do, I think I uh, to, I think I'm just going to jump to the end and then we can have time maybe to ask a few questions. Um, this is a, this is an e-toy system in which, um, well, first of all, we have a, a, a MIDI player here. Um, and let me, let me uh, play a bit of it. Can you hear that music? Can you give me a thumbs up? You cannot hear the music? Okay, so let me, I'm going to... Now maybe you can hear it through the microphone. Okay. So this whole uh, MIDI player was implemented in Sweet, and you can go down and you can actually see how the music synthesis is done. Um, this player here goes, it says a score up and shows you the progress through the score. Um, and this, here we have um, some, uh, some images on the screen of the players playing the music. And, uh, and if you look at their sweet, at their e toy script, you can see that. Um, then, uh, but if you move the x, um, if you move the y coordinate um, of one of these characters, the scale gets bigger and smaller. Um, not only that, but it sets the scalar and, and the scale factor. Excuse me. It sets the slider um, for the. Um,
And, uh, and I think that some of the things that we've done and, and that you've done in the sweet community is to isolate those certain situations where something becomes clear. Uh, if you saw that, uh, if you saw that lively video when you put the, uh, the rotating star one on top of another, you see suddenly it's, it's like bringing mathematics to life. You don't have to explain it, you just see it. And, uh, and that's sort of what we've always been, been trying to do. It's an exciting time because, you know, until this, uh, this century, uh, well, instead of the previous century, until computers, mathematics was mainly a, uh, an analytic science. You know, it looked at the outside world, and then people would come up with formulas. Um, but now with computers, you can come up with formulas and do things in the outside world. You can make sounds, you can make music, you can make images. So it's mathematics has been turned around to being active entity now. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what I felt, it, um, it never feels bad to me that things are new for people, that it's always, it's always fun when people see something and get excited by it. Um, thanks, that was a great question. Any other questions? Oh, yes. You guys probably need to go off and, and have lunch. But if, uh, I really appreciate the chance to talk, uh, and I apologize if things were cut short a bit. Um, and I know the video is difficult, but I really appreciate your, uh, your willingness to stick with the technolo technological difficulties. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. So, my question is, I have two questions. One is, what are you working these days? What are your current projects uh, or things that you are you're, that you're uh, paying attention to and spending time? Second question, what is, what is your vision uh, about all the changes we are getting from many places in computer science. Uh, how, how, what's your vision? <coughs> what, what can we do to not get lost in the middle of so many possibilities? Okay. Well, um, what I'm working on right now uh, is uh, you, you got to see a pretty good version of it if you saw that at the beginning of that. Uh, Lively, uh, lively web tape. And uh, so it's being able to do the kinds of things we do in Squeak, but uh, in the, in the, more in the web context. And uh, I don't know if you saw the part thing being used there, but uh, just making it really easy to take anything you built and put it in the cloud where somebody else can get it and bring it into their world. Um, so it's the same kinds of things that we did in Squeak, but uh, sort of uh, in the cloud across the planet, you know. Um, and what I'm working on right now uh, with the other people in the Lively Journal uh, is um, getting collaboration to work more. So we've, we've got a pretty nice system for doing, uh, you know, dynamic objects. Uh, in a browser and, uh, and stored in the cloud. Um, but I want to make it so that uh, many people can do that together sort of in real time. You know? and, uh, and this is something that other people are working on as well. Um, and I thought, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I finished up this little squeak demo with, with music and, uh, and, and graphics going and uh, and I thought that my sort of image for, uh, for that working in the kind of work I'm doing now is like a drumming group. You know, you'd like to have an environment in which one person can start doing something and then somebody else adds to it and it becomes bigger and greater and somebody else adds to it and then together those people find a direction, you know, so it's this, uh, the amazing thing about the internet is, is that it really has connected the planet. 
And, uh, and so there are all sorts of possibilities out there waiting to be done. And I'm just trying to, uh, I and the people I'm working with, we're trying to um, put together the software that will support that sort of in these uh, artistic and human ways uh, as well as the technical ways. So anyway, that's, that's kind of my vision and what, what I'm doing right now. Okay. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Len. It was amazing.